decipher here. Detroit is an interesting case for historical accuracy in cinema. I wouldn't say it's completely accurate, but then again, neither does the film. Instead, this is almost entirely disputed history. There are no definitive accounts of what happened, only murky and often self-contradictory information. And this film goes a long way to exploring that information. It is about the Algiers Motel incident during the 1967 Detroit riot. This riot was part of an even greater trend that year called the Long Hot Summer. In 1967, there were a series of race riots unlike anything the United States had seen since the Red Summer of 1919. Almost 160 separate riots happened. These all had different direct causes, but one root, race relations. Race riots had swelled alongside the civil rights movement of the late 1950s and 60s, but the movement had maintained a spirit of nonviolence. After 1964 with the passage of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act a year later, the main goals of the movement were solidified into law. The problems of de facto segregation, such as white flight, red line districting, and social inequality through poor economic mobility remained. As these issues remained unaddressed, the nonviolent cohesion of the civil rights movement began to dissolve among factionalism, sometimes to the point of outright advocating violence or at least the demeanor of violence. This was exacerbated by a white economic and political power structure that all but refused to bring the sweeping changes to fruition. For instance, the Detroit police remained 95% white in 1967, despite blacks comprising 40% of the city's population. All of this brought the long hot summer of 1967. Throughout that summer, riots spread across the United States. After 159 of these riots concluded, more than 80 people were killed, most of whom were black. Detroit was the worst of these incidents. The police had been raiding black nightclubs because they were unlicensed, even though most licensed nightclubs did not allow blacks. In the third raid of one club, black revelers refused to go silently. They were in an office that often functioned as the United Community League for Civic Action during the day, and they were celebrating the return of two black veterans from Vietnam. Understandably, the 85 revelers didn't want to be arrested under such conditions. As they were being hauled off into paddy wagons, someone from the growing crowd threw a Molotov cocktail. In a later memoir, the club owner actually claimed he was the one to throw it. This all spiraled out of control, as the mostly white police force tried to crack down on the ensuing riot. That white police force was no accident. It had been constituted after a race riot during the Civil War, specifically to stop black activism. Another couple of riots during World War II took more than 30 lives and had only reinforced disproportionate white control of the Detroit police. As 1967's riot grew, these historic factors reinforced the growing violence. It grew to horrendous proportions, lasting for five days and killing more than 40 people, 33 of which were black. One incident became the focal point of controversy, when police responded to supposed gunshots and committed extreme acts of brutality against the occupants of the Algiers Motel, killing three of them who were by nearly all accounts unarmed and compliant. The officers who committed this brutality were never convicted, though an unofficial People's Tribunal was convened by the black community and included prominent members such as Rosa Parks. It ceremonially pronounced guilty in abstention. A year later, after the assassination of Martin Luther King, an even greater wave of riots swept the United States. Though more riots happened and more damage was caused throughout the nation, less people lost their lives. Detroit had another riot as a result of the MLK riots, with a couple people being killed. This was not the last race riot in the city either. In 1975, there was a major outbreak with two fatalities and a further minor incident as part of the Rodney King riots of 1992. One of the most enduring legacies of the long hot summer and Detroit riots in general was the incident at the Algiers Motel, which is the subject of this movie, but it is shrouded in controversy. What happened at Algiers Motel? It's not a nice story to tell. 
Though three police officers and a security guard were tried for the incident, no one was convicted of anything. The People's Tribunal was merely a symbolic gesture and offered no evidence of their convictions. So much of this story has been brought together by oral history. The problem there is that these accounts are often contradictory. Oral history is inherently problematic. Some say there was a starter pistol that prompted the incident. It's just a starter pistol. It, it just starts races. It don't kill nobody. Others deny it. No one has offered a direct story for two of the three people killed, and the other is confused at best, willfully ignorant at worst. One of the women, both of which were the only white victims of police brutality in the motel that night, has since changed her name and removed herself from public scrutiny. One of the former police officers, to this day, still refuses any wrongdoing, and almost everyone involved has had inconsistencies in their stories pointed out from the trial to other oral accounts. The beginning of these accounts was put to print only a year after the incident. While it remains the most important work outside of police and court documents, it was also too soon to be completely coherent, and was released before the trials even took place. So even the most cogent work on the subject is veiled by controversy. Onto this contentious ground steps the film. The filmmaking duo of Catherine Bigelow and Mark Bowl seemed to like contentious work. They made Zero Dark Thirty, a film I cannot review because of how little I can research into it. Luckily, this one has more of a trail to follow. They hired a few researchers to help them create this movie, and I think they did a pretty good job for the most part. This movie is at pains to explore the socioeconomic situation of Detroit in 1967. It spends a good three minutes doing so, and with pretty good graphics. I'd like to see this kind of thing more often. If you've got to set up the film's context, do so like this. Not another Star Wars crawl or whatever. The stark ferocity of the riots and how deranged the situation was is well represented here. Many publishers were at a loss for words to explain the violence. Time Magazine even said, The riot was the most sensational expression of an ugly mood of nihilism and anarchy that has ever gripped a small but significant segment of America's Negro minority. Then, just as now, even the national media could not see the underlying causes of racial tensions. Yet, this movie does not flinch away from the violence. It shows blacks attacking black stores and willfully looting, as well as police and army brutality for clear racial reasons. The best part is that the movie focuses on a specific part of the craziness, though obviously the most well-known bit. This is something movie makers need to do more. Finally, the depiction of what happened at the motel is consistent with particular interpretations of the story. It clearly shows where it may be theorizing a bit. Be still and stay quiet or the next one is for real. Allowing the viewer to think why we don't know everything for sure. You're free to go. But you don't talk about this to anyone ever. You understand? Because I got your name. Much of it is disputed, though. For instance, the black security guard was testified against by two of the victims for having taken part in the beatings, though others have said otherwise. All things considered, it is fairly accurate, with few departures from the source material. Yet, this movie has been demeaned by some scholars. There are two distinct departures from the stories that I could find. The first was that the starter pistol has never claimed to have been fired out a window. Army radio reports only said shots fired, nothing so distinct as the film shows. It's a minor inaccuracy, and quite an understandable one. The other one is also minor. The film shows one of the women having her clothes ripped off by accident. When most stories say they both had their clothes ripped off to shame them through racial slurs for their supposed sleeping with black men. This is a case where the film actually makes the incident seem less horrific than it truly was. But scholars have actually gone after the film for its omissions. For instance, the film does not show the People's Tribunal or much of the surrounding civil rights struggle. It could have shown a massive protest in 1963 against the police force's disproportionate representation and brutality. It also doesn't show that the club that was raided and began the riot was a civil rights office during the day. 
These are valid points, but these historians argue from silence instead. To this end, they say, what makes this film not just sloppy but downright dangerous is that this very denial of black life, this blindness to the experience and perspectives of black people, makes possible the kind of brutal and discriminatory law enforcement and the lack of accountability around it prevalent in the United States today. I think this is unwarranted criticism. They go so far as to compare this film to the birth of a nation. I cannot imagine how anyone could draw such a conclusion. These are not telling omissions. Yes, it would be good to show the reasoning for the initial protest, at least more than a crowd simply being angry about people being arrested, but that is not sufficient to say that it enables discriminatory law enforcement. They also claim that all of the arrests during the riots that did not result in convictions somehow show most of these arrests were illegitimate. Wouldn't that same reasoning show that the accusations against the three police officers were illegitimate? Pointing out omissions is one thing, but the arguments these three put in the absence is its own form of illegitimacy. For arguing from silence is the essence of conspiracy theorizing, something that ought never be practiced by historians such as themselves. For instance, their review of the subject makes no mention of the long hot summer. Should I draw the conclusion that they are trying to push a racist disposition? Absolutely not. I'm sorry if this sounds harsh, but this article was itself undeservingly harsh. Ultimately, I think the arguments for the movie's accuracy outweigh those against it tremendously. But this is very much contested history, so it depends on what you believe should be conveyed to an audience to make sure you know it is contested. Maybe there needs to be more filters or Dutch angles to enforce this fundamental fact. But I think Detroit is sufficient for what we can expect from such a murky subject.